Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you your members of the National Education Association Executive Committee. They work tirelessly for you uh, on behalf of our members and our leaders every single day and mostly all night. They are an extraordinarily talented group of leaders that Princess and Lily and I have the pleasure and honor to serve with. From Illinois, Eric Brown. From Mississippi, Kevin Gilbert. Uh, Kevin is not with us uh, for the Representative Assembly. He had to leave. He was here but had a family emergency, so please keep him in your thoughts and prayers. From Wisconsin, Shelley Moore Krajacek. And baby Krajacek. <laughs> and from California, George Sheridan. And from Oregon, Hannah Vandering. I would also like to, at this time, as always, recognize some key staff who uh, are so, such an integral part to making sure our representative assembly flows very smoothly. First, please give it up for our executive director, John Stocks. Next, we have the ever-popular General Counsel, Alice O'Brien. And of course, keeping all of our numbers in order, we have our Chief Financial Officer, Michael McPherson. Now, delegates, if you have been coming to this representative assembly over the last three decades, you have heard this familiar name introduced to you many, many, many times. It is Michael Edwards, the director of NEA Center for Governance. But, delegates, this year is very special. Michael has made the decision after 36 years to retire from the NEA. I need you to know that Michael has an amazing wealth of knowledge about NEA's history and an encyclopedic memory of its policies and governing documents. We will miss him desperately because he has served with distinction in many departments throughout the NEA, from government relations to labor relations and finally to governance. Please rise and give us a special thank you and happy retirement to Mr. Michael Edwards. Once again, we have serving as our official parliamentarian for the 2018 Representative Assembly, Jim Slaughter. He is joined, yeah, give him a hand. <laughs> he gets us all in order, especially me. Uh, helping Jim this year is Michael Telercio, who is also an attorney and a parliamentarian and who has worked that's right. They're clapping for you, Michael, because he has worked in many of your states at your state representative assemblies. Thank you, Michael, for joining us this year. It always gives me great pleasure to introduce NEA's past presidents and executive directors. There are many reasons to be proud of NEA's long and distinguished history. 
Joining me on stage are the leaders who represent our legacy and the best of our ideals, our association's former presidents and executive directors. Please stand as I introduce you. George Fisher, president from 1969 to 1970. John Ryer, president from 1975 to 1979. Mary Futrell, <laughs> president from 1983 to 1989. Keith Geiger, president from 1989 to 1996. Bob Chase, president from 1996 to 2002. Reg Weaver, President, from 2002 to 2008, Dennis Van Rokel, President, from 2008 to 2014, Don Cameron, Executive Director from 2083 to 2000, and John Wilson, Executive Director from 2000 to 2011. I would also like to acknowledge those who were not able to join us this year. Past President Lois Ettinger, Past President Helen Wise, and Past Executive Director Terry Herndon. Give it up for them. The horror and the humanity, the trials and the triumphs, the injustices and the inspiration. This was a year filled with both challenges that threatened us and opportunities that allowed us to soar. We watched in horror as our students again endured more heartbreaking violence and shameful inequities. And we witnessed the best of humanity as our students and our members and our communities rose up and said enough. As we meet those challenges, as we embrace and magnify those inspirations, we, the largest labor union in this country, yeah. We, the NEA, have the good fortune to be led by a phenomenal woman, one uh, who embodies both strength and compassion. She cries with our kids, and she cuts down our opponents. She understands when to call out, and when to caress. She is kind and she is caring. And she is cutthroat. She adeptly navigates the soft touch and the strong arm. And she does it because she never, ever forgets those sixth grade students she taught with joy and high expectations. She always remembers the homeless children who depended on her for hope. You see, it's always about them. And it's about you. The men and women who have dedicated your lives to nurturing and educating the students of America. 
It's about love. Please welcome to this, the 2018 Representative Assembly, our champion, our shero, our president, Lily Eskelson Garcia. Becky, thank you for that introduction, but that was not the best introduction I've ever had, okay? <laughs> the best introduction I have ever had was once a PTA president kind of read my resume, and then she said, and I can tell you from my heart that Lily Eskelson truly is everything she pretends to be. <laughs> You know, how zen is that? You know, that's kind of cool. And I was thinking about that because, really, we can't be pretending to be anything these days. We have got to get real. What we're facing is real. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous to public education, to public service. It's dangerous to our democracy, to the protections for people who need and who deserve protecting. Good Lord, how long have we been living through this administration? I know, it's like a year and a half. Doesn't it seem a whole lot longer? It's like we're living in dog years. You know, think about it. There is something going on. Something is different. There's something different about this moment in our history, billionaires like Betsy DeVos and the Koch brothers have never been more embedded in political power. Billionaires are trumping the rights of working people to organize. Billionaires are tearing families apart, forcing toddlers out of the arms of their mothers as they beg for asylum, for a place they can escape violence and persecution. Billionaires are selling our public schools to charter chain businesses. Billionaires have placed themselves above the rest of us, they have no sense of servant leadership. Billionaires believe they are our rulers. They demand our silence. They demand we pretend. Instead of speaking out on racial injustice, they demand we stand in silence and pretend that everything's just fine. We're supposed to pretend that poor people are to blame for a housing crisis. We're supposed to pretend that hunger doesn't impact the learning of children. We're supposed to pretend that returning to a time that allowed insurance companies to discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions will make healthcare great again. There's something different about this moment. These are dark days. But Martin Luther King reminded us, only when it's dark enough can you see the stars. And oh my, we have seen some true stars align. We have seen the people march. We have seen the people speak up. We have seen the people refuse to be silent, refuse to pretend. We have seen the rise of the resistance. In these past 18 months that seem like 18 years, how many of you 
in this room right now have made your voices heard for women's rights. How many of you have stood with our dreamers and our immigrant families? You were beautiful at that incredible rally right here in downtown Minnesota. NEA was in that house. And this community felt your love. How many of you have stood in these last 18 months and lifted your voice for racial justice? How many of you have fought for the dignity and the acceptance of our LGBT communities? How many of you have stood proudly this year in a national red for Ed Way? You challenged, you challenged those politicians who pretend that educators had taken vows of poverty and obedience for the honor of teaching and working in our public schools. Our red wave started in the great state of West Virginia. <laughs> West Virginia is now a verb. West Vir don't me go all West Virginia on you. It's now a verb. And then we saw Kentucky. Where are you, Kentucky? And then Oklahoma. Where are you, Oklahoma? Arizona. Where are you, Arizona? Colorado. Where are you, Colorado? North Carolina. Where are you? us. You lifted us no matter where we lived. You spoke the powerful truth that we are fierce fighters who will stand up for ourselves and stand up for our students, and we will be heard. There are stars that shine in this dark night, but I'm going to tell you, I'm not sure that any shine brighter than our fearless students who are marching for their lives. Now, it's hard, you can tell. You can see. I just put on this makeup. <laughs> it's hard for me to fathom the tragic deaths of students, of our colleagues, to gun violence in school after school after school, from our smallest kindergarten babies to college campuses. We mourn. And it's hard for me to talk about it, so I'm not even going to try. I'm going to do something I'm not sure that has ever been done in a president's report to this RA, but I need to see a star shine right now. And so, for the first time, I yield my time to one of our students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. I yield my time to recent high school graduate, David Hogg. Thank you guys. Now, first off, I hope you guys understand that that applause that you just gave me, you should feel a hundred times for yourselves. 
Educators literally have the most important job in the world, and God knows this country needs some education right now. Now, uh, I just want to let you guys know, uh, not many people know this, but the first protest that I ever went to was an NEA protest with my mom, who's been a teacher for over 20 years. Now, I was three at the time, and they were fighting for better pay. And you know what they did? They went out and they got that pay. By fighting for what you believe in, you win. You may fail and fail again, but eventually, so long as you continue, you will succeed. Uh, and before I begin, one other thing. When I say America, can you guys say, hear our prayer? Like this, like, America? Hear our prayer. There we go. OK. So. Time and time again, when gunfire erupts in our schools and on our streets, the rest of the country sends their thoughts and prayers. Educators, America, today we want you to hear our thoughts and prayers. What we want is simple. We want to live, thrive, grow old, have children, and become the next generation of inventors, innovators, and educators. Sadly, this generation is dying. We're not dying just by the bullets that arbitrarily shatter the lives of our youth and our future. It's also the divisiveness in Washington and beyond that is killing this generation. America, we have been speaking up, mobilizing, and standing strong because our family, our friends mean the world to us. They give us our relief and our grief, our courage in our times of fear, and laughter when there's too much to despair. We're young, and that means we don't have to accept the status quo, and we never will. We intend to close the gap between the world as it is and what it should be. We intend to bring truth to power so that money and power no longer dictate the laws that put our youth at risk. America, hear our prayer. And let me be very clear, we are not against the Constitution or the Second Amendment. We are for a just, we are just for a safer country, safer schools, and safer communities for us all. And we're not against NRA members either. In fact, we love you. If you're listening and you're an NRA member who buys a gun lock to keep your family safe and your kids at home, at home safe, we love you. We want the NRA member who believes that waiting periods could help end the scourge of suicides that this country faces in all communities to know we love them too. We want the NRA member who turns in their AR-15 because they don't need it to hunt or shoot clays to know we love them. We want the NRA member who is appalled at their leaders who call us terrorists and soulless to know we love you too. It is time, time that as Americans we take our finger off the trigger that we call partisanship and put down the gun of hate and vitriol and realize arms are for hugging. <laughs> America, hear our prayer. We want our schools to be places for learning, where hands are raised for discussions and debates, not to show SWAT teams we're unarmed. We want our schools to be free from the sounds of gunfire, free from the deafening screams of pain, free from the wail of sirens and cries of grief-stricken moms, dads, sisters, brothers, and best friends. America, hear our prayer. We want our educators like you to be armed, armed with books, papers, pencils, computers, and the supplies and resources you need to help us soar and thrive in this world. On February 14th, we lost educators we loved. Scott Beagle was a geography teacher and a cross-country coach. He was killed protecting his students from the shooter. Aaron Feist was a great football coach. The players loved him. He threw himself in front of the shooter to protect students. And Chris Hickson was our athletic director and wrestling coach. 
The day after, the team huddled and cried. So educators, we are out there in the streets with you and for you so we can all be safe and go home to our families at night. We are demanding that our streets and neighborhoods be safe though, so that we can enjoy the outdoors, walk to the corner store for some Skittles, play sports in the park in our hoodies, hang out with our good friends without the fear that a gun is going to take another life. We love going to high schools. We love going to high schools and colleges to register new voters. And we can't begin to describe the joy we see on our new friends' faces when they sign up to participate in this democracy. We hope that every one of your high school students in your classrooms will vote or be registered if they can't vote this November. It is your responsibility to make sure that happens. Because the politicians, they don't want it to happen. But as educators, I know as a student and a leader of our youth that there is nothing more powerful in America than a pissed off teacher. <laughs> the youth. The youth, they are ready, they are energized. They understand that they have the power, the strength, and the possibility to right the wrongs in this nation. And they know that what they want, when they, when they show up this time, the young people will win. <laughs> America, hear our prayer. When tragedy strikes, no one yells out, I'm a Democrat, or I'm a Republican, liberal or conservative, gun owner or not. We are one, we are united, we are American. And this unity is something that we have to build everywhere. And as educators, we need your help to do this. Because it takes education and understanding to realize that in America, divisiveness is what our politicians want. Divisiveness is what drives war, hate, and vitriol. As educators, we have to work constantly, and I'm not just talking about teachers, I'm talking about each and every one of you in here, from the people that are on this board, to the janitorial staff, to the people that are working three to four jobs to raise a family. We are all educators and educating our friends. That love and compassion is the only thing that can disarm hate. We need your red for, we need your red for ed energy, because education is truly our greatest weapon to win this battle. We cannot accept 96 people dying every day because of a gun. We cannot accept a society where African American men are 13 times more likely to die because of a gun than I am. <laughs> or where known offenders have an easy path to a gun and choose to kill their family. We can't keep hosing down the blood, repairing shattered windows and bullet riddled doors, and burying our young, because when we bury our young, we bury our future. This has to change. America, hear our prayer. It's time to ban bump stocks, raise the legal age to 21, and institute universal background checks. Right at this moment, this very moment, when politicians in Washington fight over taking money from the NRA, another person is buying a gun illegally and planning a mass shooting. It's time to get woke. We have cried too much, placed too many flowers on too many graves, mourned too many best friends, family members, and educators who love us. America, you've given us your thoughts and prayers. Now we give you ours. The time has come. From this moment on, say it, feel it, and believe it, and say it with us, never again, never again, never again. Thank you.
hermanos y hermanas. He's not done, he tells me. Just, just one last thing. Don't just clap, vote. You get extra credit for that one, okay? So I hadn't planned on saying this, but I need to. I had uh, a delegate come up to me and say, I don't feel safe in this RA. Now, David just felt an incredible amount of love from us. I know that there are people in this RA who would disagree with some of the solutions that he proposed. In this house, we don't tell people what they need to feel or say. Whatever comes before you, you have the right to your opinion and you have a right to get to a microphone and express that opinion respectfully. And we will respect every point of view. It hurt me that someone felt that they may be booed or that someone might not, um, might not be their friend anymore if they disagreed uh, with what is uh, maybe obviously the majority. You hear passion in David and in his friends and in our students in every state. We've seen it. You've seen them come together in this collective voice, and we love the collective voice. You feel the power of their action. They're not complaining. They're not waiting for permission. He's so full of himself. They are not <laughs> waiting to be saved. He knows how powerful he and his friends are. They're not pretending. They're demanding something from all of us, but they're demanding something of themselves, too. But there's something behind that power. And when you see them standing together, you, you can just feel it. When you see them marching, there is a profound power in their love for one another, in their love for community. There's something different about this moment. I feel something different in me that I don't like because I don't always feel that love. I have worked so hard all my life to defeat bad politicians and bad legislation and called out bad actors, and I have never hated them before. I have felt hate in me in this last year and a half, and I don't like it. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like me. It feels like I've lost something about who I pretend to be. And I have seen families that will no longer talk to each other. I've seen my colleagues who never back down from a good debate now look at each other like they're enemies because they disagree on an issue. And I feel like we're in danger of being sucked in to that agenda that feeds off fear and hate. I feel like we're in danger of losing something, and I want it back. I don't want to turn into what I'm fighting. I don't want to use fear and hate to win. I heard a quote, you don't win by destroying what you hate, you win by saving what you love. And I used that quote a few weeks ago and a woman came up to me and she said, Lily, thank you so much for quoting the Bible. Actually, it was the last Star Wars movie. <laughs> Saint Luke, Luke Skywalker, you know, it's all good, it's good. But we need something, we need something to center us, to ground us. You know, I felt really centered with the blessing that we received. Back 
backstage, we're like putting things together and duct taping, duct taping stuff, and it's just, you know, like one more little crisis after another. Um, but it all comes together, and those wonderful, wonderful uh, Native American uh, friends and family of ours, they just kind of like calmed me down and centered me. You have to have a poem, a quote, a prayer. Um, I have other things that I use. Because there's nothing we can do if we forget actually have all we need. All we need to stay true to ourselves. There's nothing you can do that can't be done. Nothing you can say that can't be sung and nothing you can say that you can learn. Before he leaves, a little bit more love for David. Right here. David is not waiting for permission and neither are we. Give it up for our president, Lily Eskelson Garcia, David Hogg, and the mighty members of the National Education Association. Give it up. Give it up. 